Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us for today's webinar on the use of the guidelines for design and construction, an architect's and owner's and an AHJ's perspective, one of 10 webinars hosted by the Facility Guidelines Institute on the 2018 Guidelines for Design and Construction Documents. I'm Heather Livingston, Director of Operations for FGI and Managing Editor of the 2022 edition of the Guidelines. I am pleased to be your moderator today. FGI is proud to host this series of continuing education webinars developed to broaden understanding of the guidelines documents, the revision process, and to highlight key changes in the current edition of the guidelines. To obtain AI credit, you will need to coordinate with the person who registered your organization on MADCAD. That person will be receiving follow-up directions by email. Each attendee seeking AIA learning units must complete a 10-question quiz on the content of this webinar in order to receive AIA continuing education credit. The views and opinions expressed during today's presentation are those of the presenters and may not represent the official position of FGI nor the HGRC. And now it's my pleasure to introduce today's presenters. Wade Rudolph, former WHEA president, 2007 ASHE regional leader, has overseen healthcare support services for more than 25 years with experience in clinical engineering, property management, transportation, food and nutrition services, security, laundry, safety, risk, construction, emergency management, and maintenance. He served by supporting four cycles of the development of the guidelines, providing educational programs for WHEA, Wisconsin Association of Infection Control Practitioners, the University of Wisconsin College of Engineering, and ASHE Region 6. John Williams has more than 25 years of experience with healthcare design and regulation, He's the manager of the Washington State Department of Health Construction Review Program, which is responsible for reviewing licensed healthcare facilities for state licensing, federal certification, and building code requirements. He's the chair of the International Code Council's Healthcare Committee and also serves on technical committees for the HGRC, NFPA 99, and the Washington State Building Code Council. Kirsten Waltz is a principal in Smith Group's Boston office. Kirsten is experienced in programming, planning, project management, and design of healthcare projects. Her interest in healthcare architecture stems from her genuine desire to improve the patient and staff experiences and better their day-to-day -day lives. With project experience ranging from 5,000 square foot departmental renovations to 450,000 square foot new hospitals, Kirsten is able to address the smallest details while addressing, I'm sorry, while maintaining a broad overview of the entire project. Kirsten is a member of the American College of Healthcare Architects and serves as vice chair of the outpatient document group for the 2018 HGRC. She is especially interested in evidence-based design, which uses credible research to inform the design process and achieve the best operational and functional outcomes for each project. Wade, John, and Kirsten are all members of the steering committee of the 2022 HGRC. Welcome to you all, and thanks so much for being with us today. The goal of this presentation is to give you an understanding of how to use the set of documents that we call the FGI guidelines. Versions of these books have been around for many years and have grown out of a series of documents first published by the U.S. federal government and later by the American Institute of Architects. To understand how to use these books, we believe it's important to understand the purpose of the guidelines. So what are they? Per the FGI Guidelines Institute, the purpose of the guidelines is to provide a minimum set of standards for the design and construction of healthcare facilities. This means a multidisciplinary group went through a consensus-based process and ultimately determined that the words written on the pages of these books are the absolute bare minimums intended for all of the facilities specifically described therein. These standards are not best practices. We believe they're minimums. Best practices are above this standard. An example of a best practice is the appendix language, which shows up in the book as shaded text, or the Beyond Fundamentals documents found on the website. These provide further direction and guide you to where you can find more information. Are they the standard of care? Do enough designers, architects, and engineers use the guidelines 
for them to be commonly recognized as the standards of general practice? Ultimately, I think this is something that the courts will have to decide. However, it is a widely recognized and adopted set of standards across the U.S., and they have been around for a long, long time. Is it just a book with some good ideas in it? We believe it's beyond that. These are more than just good ideas. They are minimums. So what else are they? In some states, they're adopted by a rule or statute as the law of the land. This means that some authority having jurisdiction, and this could be a state legislative body or a state agency like the Department of Health, has referenced the FGI guidelines as a minimum requirement and they compel facilities and designers to follow it. Are they the requirements for reimbursement? Currently, the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services do not reference the FGI as a condition of participation in the Medicare reimbursement program. However, though, CMS does require that you meet the, your state's licensure requirement. So if your state requires the FGI, that is a de facto um, requirement for participation. Other pay payers do not specifically reference the guidelines yet, but this could change in the future. We do know that guidelines are referenced by some, but not all, third-party accreditation organizations. And these are agencies like the Joint Commission, DNV, AAAHC. Um, of course, facilities often have a choice of which accrediting body they use, Although, if you don't follow the FGI guidelines during design, you may limit the options of which accreditation organization you can receive. Finally, this book is not intended to be a comprehensive guide for ongoing operations of a facility. It's a set of design and construction standards. It's useful when you're operating a facility, um, but by no means does it cover the breadth and depth of issues that an operational manual would. Next slide. Sometimes, though, the minimum standards is not the best fit. This can work both ways. Sometimes, to accomplish the quality goals of an organization, a facility may need to design above the minimum standard. Sometimes, the actual use may justify designs that are below the standard. For example, perhaps a facility wants to provide enough space for storage on an intensive care unit. Well, what is enough space? The answer may be to provide more square footage than the guidelines actually require. Maybe the facility provides a new treatment that isn't really described in the guidelines yet. In that case, the design may need to choose similar functions and consider the requirements for those functions and provide additional infrastructure to accommodate the need. Sometimes the scope of treatment is so narrow that the design below the general minimum is appropriate. For example, eye surgery. Eye surgery is surgery, However, some types of eye surgery are very repetitive, very predictable, and therefore require less equipment and space. In those cases, a much more specific use may justify something that is less than the general minimum. Again, this, this works both ways. Whenever facilities, designers, and AHJ run across these cases, they should consider all credible sources to determine what happens next. Beyond Fundamentals is a newly created resource to provide guidance on new modalities and design concepts. That's a good resource. Uh, previous future uh, versions of the FGI can provide some context and help us understand the progression of thought over time. In all cases, we need to have a clear understanding of what is actually happening in the facility. Carefully prepared functional programs and safety risk assessments are key to documenting and communicating this. Ultimately, though, the final design should consider the core concepts of patient safety and experience. Absolute requirements are driven by risk. Next slide. The guidelines are a great tool and resource to use during the programming and early design phases to challenge design minimum with the owner and developers. Even if licensure isn't an option for the opening of a suite or a building, designing to the least code minimum gives future flexibility for licensure and certification in the future. The appendix, as John mentioned, or shaded text, provides additional information and consideration points beyond the code minimum that should be discussed during the early design phase. 
Both the guidelines and beyond fundamentals provide guidance to the designer and programmers to have a conversation with the authority having jurisdiction for the current best practices within the ever-changing healthcare environment. If the state you are designing the work in does not reference the current version of the guidelines, don't be afraid to reference the current minimum standards during your initial discussions with the AHJ as well as the Beyond Fundamental documents. The Beyond Fundamental documents represent the current research that should be referenced at the start of design. Next slide. In recent years, the guidelines have split from one single document to a set of documents based on facility type. A distinct set of requirements has been identified for hospitals, residential facilities, and outpatient facilities. The blue hospital book focuses on acute care settings. Patients stay overnight, but generally the overall length of stay is relatively short. The red residential book focuses on residential care where the length of stay is much longer. They are typically settings where residents receive ongoing care in a place that they reside. The orange outpatient book is the newest addition to the guidelines and covers outpatient facilities where patients receive care for less than 24 hours. The split to three different books reflects an acknowledgement that these facilities operate differently. They serve a different clientele and often have different needs and goals. As such, the inherent risks are not the same. We also realize that as a healthcare delivery system continues to change in response to population needs, reimbursement, and technology, the clear boundaries that these documents imply will begin to blur. With your help, we commit to watching these trends and responding appropriately. These divisions are not meant to squelch innovation. Instead, they are meant to accommodate change by accepting the breadth of difference in facility types and providing a forum for specific conversation about the needs of each. If you design an outpatient department within a hospital setting, you will only need to look at the outpatient book. If you have a department in a hospital setting that provides care for both inpatients and outpatients, You'll have to look at the requirements across both books and work with your local AHJ to confirm the most stringent approach. Next slide. The books are arranged in a similar manner. Each book is broken into parts. Part one speaks to the general requirements. Parts two and three get into the specific requirements for different facility types. Each part is broken into a series of chapters which contain sections and subsections. A glossary is available for specific items and phrases that users will encounter. And these are important because they change how and where you apply certain requirements. An appendix is also available to provide commentary and additional useful information for some requirements. The appendix is neither written nor intended to be mandatory. It is intended to provide a deeper understanding of the intent of the requirement in the text. As you will no notice that the word should is used in this context. To assist with navigation, the FGI has a consistent system of numbering each requirement. Each section is provided with a sequential number. The first two numbers represent the chapter that a requirement is in. This is followed by a dash and then a series of numbers that are unique to that section. The example to the left shows a requirement for part two, chapter 2.1. Section 2.1-7.2.2.3 details with doors hardware. The subsections are further broken in outline form. So for example, if you want to direct someone to the requirements for sliding doors, you would refer to 2.1-7.2.2.3-1b. Also notice there's an asterisk beside this section, which indicates that there is appendix note for this section. Appendices are numbered differently, and each appendix note uses the same section number preceded by the letter A. There are, different, there are a few differences between the books, and we'll look at those next. So first we'll consider the hospital book. 
Part one covers some very fundamental concepts about design, construction, and regulation. As such, it applies broadly both to renovation and new construction. This lays out the basic approach of the document, how to use it, when it applies, what other rules apply, etc. Part one is where we describe the functional program and safety risk assessment as well. It also sets expectations for the project process, like safety during construction and commissioning during completion. It really kind of operates as the springboard that helps you jump into a project. Next slide. Part two of the hospital guidelines contain the bulk of the technical provisions. That is, it tells us specific requirements like how big something needs to be, or how wide, how many outlets, things like that. It's also where we need to make some choices. It has a few different chapters that we can look at. Chapter 2.1 describes what we call common elements. These common elements uh, are basic building blocks of a facility. Features like patient rooms, exam rooms, typical units like med surge or surgery, the basic building blocks of a facility. Not every hospital will have all of these elements. So you really only use chapter 2.1 when you're specifically sent here by a direct reference from one of the facility chapters. The facility chapters are also in part two. These chapters have titles that describe the different types of hospitals you may encounter. So if you find the chapter uh, that most accurately describes the type of building that you are building, uh, you're going to follow those requirements. For example, if you're designing a children's hospital, you should start with chapter 2.7 titled Specific Requirements for Children's Hospital. That chapter is going to reference you back to the exact sections of 2.1 common elements that apply. Finally, one of these chapters is going to reference you ultimately back to part three. And part three is essentially a copy of ASHRAE 170, which is a standard relating to ventilation of healthcare facilities. This contains air delivery requirements, pressure relationships, filtration standards, humidity requirements, those types of things. Next slide. In terms of organization, the outpatient book is very similar to the hospital book, as John outlined. Part one is the general section, which sets the stage for how the document is used. It covers the basic concepts of planning, design, and commissioning. This is where we get information on other referenced codes and standards, functional program, and the safety risk assessment. Part one applies to all facilities where referenced. Part two covers the technical requirements. How big does a room have to be? How many hand wash sinks do you have to have? What do the hand wash sinks look like? It also lists specific requirements for each facility type. The outpatient book offers two basic approaches to determine which requirements are minimums in your project. Approach one and approach two. Approach one, or the single chapter approach, envisions using a facility chapter and common elements in a traditional manner. You select a specific facility type chapter and follow the cross-references. Approach two, or the multi-chapter approach, is more freedom. And it's not as literal as the approach one and allows for variations based on risk. The third document in our series of guidelines provides a minimum standard for residential health, care, and support facilities. Again, this document is intended to apply to new and renovation projects. The first part, part one, is consistent with the first part of the outpatient and the hospital documents by providing the use of the document. Next slide. Part two in this document is organized slightly different from the hospital and the outpatient documents in that this section only includes common elements. It is in part three through five where specific facility type requirements are defined. When applicable, parts three through five will cross-reference a reader back to the part two sections as applicable. Next slide. Each document is intended to stand alone as a minimum standard. For this reason, some sections for services that are found in multiple or all healthcare type providers have been correlated 
and are common to the appropriate documents. Examples include accommodations for patients of size, exam rooms, isolation rooms, telemedicine services, imaging facilities, pre and post procedural patient care areas, sterile processing facility, as well as the glossary and the emergency department for the hospital and outpatient documents. So a step-by-step -step process can be useful when breaking down these requirements. As a recap, we suggest you follow these steps. Step one would be determine which book you should use. If you're designing an outpatient facility, use the orange book. If you're doing a residential care facility, use the red book. Once you find the book, read part one. These again are the core requirements that are going to apply to every facility that that book covers. Next slide. Step three is read the functional program requirements. This should be obtained from the owner or developed with the owner, and the functional program is then going to be used to determine which facility type you need to look at in part two. So, if your functional program describes a critical access hospital, find the chapter that most closely relates. For a critical access hospital, that's going to be chapter 2.4. Next slide. Uh, step four, read that facility chapter. Follow the references from the facility chapter back to the common elements section. That's where you are going to find more requirements. Next slide. And then finally, step five, also follow the references back to other chapters. Depending on which book you're gonna be using, that could be uh, other parts. For example, in um, part 2.4, critical access hospital, that has pointers back to 2.2, general hospitals. Also part three, ASHRAE 170. Remember again, this process is not intended to be so rigorous as to stifle the application of reason. Special cases may exist where you need to look at non-reference sections to appropriately mitigate the risk. The outpatient guidelines, uh, as Kristen, Kirsten mentioned, prescribe this flexibility by allowing two approaches, one that's based on this decision tree, one that is much more freeform. In either case, the facility, designer, and AHJ should have a frank and open conversation about application of the FGI early in the process. Next slide. As indicated previously, we have three different perspectives on how to use the guidelines based on one's lens or focus. An owner's representative uses the document differently compared to an architect or an authority having jurisdiction. A design professional uses the document different than an owner or an AHJ due to contractual or legal obligations. An AHJ's perspective adds value to understanding and how the codified document is actually enforced. We have added icons to our slides to aid the participant in understanding what perspective is being provided. In order to assist the participant in understanding the different perspectives, we'll walk through the project cycle and provide the perspectives on how to use the guidelines and how they're used by each of the three perspectives. Again, for the purposes of this presentation, we have added some icons to assist your understanding of what part of the project cycle is actually being discussed. In the conceptual business case, as an owner, we are constantly making changes to the existing spaces due to growth, reorganization, or programmatic changes in service models. We use the FGI documents to evaluate existing space for the program needs, current or future, and develop a gap analysis and with recommendations for modifications. When we're considering new space, the guidelines are helpful in leading our administrative teams to define and develop a clear understanding of delivery care models to evaluate and then when selected, we can start a basis of design for the physical space that meets the delivery of care model selected. The functional program and executive summary are developed to clearly communicate to the organization design professionals, and regulators what the intent of the project is. These documents also assist in the development of a preliminary budget for the business case review. A good executive summary will include budget expectations 
as well as inherent risks associated with a particular effort. Next slide. The functional program must be identified in the beginning to outline the functional project needs, goals, and objectives. This will serve as a base for all decision-making processes throughout the project. A functional program can be just a paragraph for small projects or more expansive documents for larger projects. The functional program should define project goals, specialty departments, shared services, operational models, phasing, risk assessments, budget, and schedule. So having a good functional program early in the process is key for helping the entire team understand the project. For the AHJ, it really helps guide us to apply the FGI guidelines appropriately. The guidelines are scalable. That means not everything applies in all cases. In theory, this is a great thing. Requirements are based on risks. This means, essentially, that you spend the most money on what has the potential to do the most harm. In practice, it takes a very clear functional program and a significant amount of trust to communicate the design intent to the authority having jurisdiction. Traditionally, the functional program has been the sole vehicle to do that. The planning and programming effort when following the guidelines sets up the program for success. Failure to develop a well-defined functional program will result in projects that simply do not meet the operational goals. I have seen projects with brand new spaces that simply cannot work for the care model selected because this step in the process went undefined. Through planning and programming phases, the program should be defined along with the operational model and shared services. It is the functional program along with the conceptual floor plans that will be reviewed with the AHJ to confirm your approach. During planning and programming, the guidelines provides guidance to facilities to understand who internally needs to be part of the, program, the planning team. Failure to bring this team together has been demonstrated to result in redesign, lost time, additional construction expenses, as well as delays. For, these, for this, these reasons, definition of the team members has been provided. Many projects developed by well-meaning administrative levels of the organization have failed due to lack of input from the key stakeholders involved in the project. The decision makers need to be defined and authority authorized appropriately to move the project forward in a timely manner. These teams need to formalize the function program so the form can be developed to follow function for the most effective use of the space. Having the correct perspectives at the time of the conversations is critical to evaluate options. Otherwise, Dominant personalities or senior leaders may make decisions that will not be that will not be the most suitable for the delivery of care models selected. It is critical to start a program with defined goals and expectations. A leader must be designated for the documentation of the functional program. This could be someone internal to the organization or an external consultant for planning and programming phases. The guidelines are just a great resource highlighting how to write a functional program and the specialty chapters should be referenced for specific departmental requirements. Starting the safety risk assessment and the infection control risk assessment during planning highlights any potential risks. The Center for Health Design has a great tool or the team can develop their own safety risk assessment that's custom to their needs. In the planning and programming phase, the design team should develop a clear understanding of the regulatory environment. This basically means what rules apply to this project and who is going to apply them. Part 1.1 of the guidelines includes this concept. It sets up the basic process that guides users on how to apply the document, when to use it, how it interacts with other regulatory documents, and which other documents are referenced. It's really important to note here that the guidelines themselves are not regulatory standards in and of themselves. 
to be a legal requirement, some entity who has a vested authority to set construction rules and standards must formally adopt the FGI guidelines by directly referencing this guideline in their statutory language. This may be a state legislature, this may be a state level department, or it could even be a state or local building department. As we mentioned earlier, the impetus to follow the guidelines may not be regulatory at all. Insurance payers or third-party accreditation organizations may stipulate that to receive reimbursement or, or accreditation, a facility must follow a certain version of the guidelines. Regardless of the project, a successful design team will identify who has authority, regulatory or otherwise, over the project that is being contemplated. The design team should understand which standard or guidelines should be used and which version. As you develop the construction documents, you have another good opportunity to work with the AHJ to connect ideas in the functional program with the design on paper. Remember, the design team has been living and working on the project for weeks, if not months, and they have a pretty good idea of what it is. If the plans and drawings that are, if the plans and drawings are that vehicle that conveys the idea of the structure from the design team's brain to the AHJ's brain, the functional program is the vehicle that con conveys the concept of use and services provided. The safety risk assessment and the general basis of design information augment this and help the AHJ understand the basic characteristics of the project. Really, use part one of the FGI to develop the functional program and safety risk assessment and share those with your AHJ. At this stage, the owner has established and developed a functional program, a managerial budget for decision-making purposes, as well as um, the actual budget for the construction. The owner needs to know, back off, and let the design professionals develop documents to meet the functional program. I cannot count the number of times the clinical teams come to me with drawings of what they expected constructed with no basic understanding of the true, re true requirements of the program. The development of the document has challenges because well-meaning clinicians and facility teams desire final edit authority, which is not always the appropriate role. These edits often result in scope creep or worse, deletion of spaces that are later determined as critical, such as storage space in the OR suite. The guidelines provide great reference for owner's representatives to follow to assure critical components of the project are included and at a size to allow the space to function. It prohibits the project proponents from oversizing the project as well as from bean counters from removing spaces that are not direct quick care but are required for prudent operations. The way to address these challenges is by establishing timelines, defining the roles of the team members, use the guidelines to assure required spaces are included, to work with a team to obtain the information to allow great design, make the entire team aware of the functional requirements, the risk assessments, and the design requirements, and the need for the organization to select equipment and furniture in this phase of the work. When documents are developed, the owner uses a space program to assure that the space needs are met and appropriate for the models of care provided. The functional program is what is used to, design, used to guide the design professionals in the organizational desires. Space requirements are a key component to allow the owners the ability to ascertain if a program will even fit in a desired space or how large a new space will need to be. The ventilation requirements determine the size of the required interstitial spaces and in many instances are a limiting factor in existing facilities. When design require documents are provided, one is well advised to conduct a review of the proposed documents against the program and requirements and the guidelines early. Many well-meaning design professionals are not aware of the requirements resulting in at best redesign and worst significant cost overruns with construction delays. As the owner's representative, 
It's on us to bring forward these requirements and clearly communicate expectations and review documents against the guidelines criteria in the facility program. Once the owner signs off that the documents are approved for construction, all these cha any changes are at the cost of the owner. As the documents are developed, it is critical to include the AHJ as a partner in the discussion. Alternative means of compliance could include shared inpatient and outpatient services, multiple specialty departments sharing support areas, and new medical procedures that have not been identified by the guidelines. It is important to come to a meeting with your AHJ prepared with the guideline documentation references and your team's approach to the alternative means of compliance. You can review errata on the website to determine if your question has already been addressed, and you can also sign up to receive notices on the website. In addition to the books, interpretations can be requested through FGI website to clarify content with the guidelines and or deferring opinions with the AHJ and design team. Design development is also a good time to get a clear understanding of the regulatory process. The FGI does not tell you how the regulatory review or inspection process is going to work. That's going to be left up to each AHJ. Some AHJs re require reviews or consultations during the design process, others only after construction documents are complete, while others may in only inspect the facility after construction with the expectation that all requirements are met. Many jurisdictions require some sort of approval before you begin construction. I suggest that you contact whichever AHJ you're working with and get a clear understanding for what the requirements are for this particular project. As human nature dictates, we all have different perspectives on how the requirements can be interpreted. This variability obviously leads to risk. Design teams can limit this risk if AHJs are willing to meet early and often on projects to understand the process, clarify interpretations and intent, and seek a common understanding of how the FGI is going to be enforced. The FGI itself can function as a good regulatory checklist. It's good to check the design as the documents develop to ensure that key requirements are met. As you meet with your AHJ, this may be something that you want to share. Some jurisdictions really benefit from that clear documentation of how the design meets the specific requirements and how this can be verified. A common phrase in the regulatory world is trust but verify. Any good relationship is built on trust. However, we're all human. The most trustworthy, well-intentioned design team can overlook things. And regulators are charged with ensuring compliance. That's a pretty heavy responsibility and the weight of that can manifest itself in different ways. Again, take full advantage of any opportunity to meet with your AHJ and discuss how the guidelines are going to be enforced. During the construction phase in an occupied building, the owner is responsible for the occupants of the building. For this reason, implementation, monitoring, and corrective actions as per the safety risk assessment are in a manner short of critical for the lives of your staff, visitors, customers, residents, and patients who may, whose care are significantly compromised before the project even started. We are seeing many method, methods provided to mitigate noise during projects, including new means and methods decreasing the decibel level of the work, as well as providing occupants with noise canceling headphones with music therapy included. Disruptive noise has been clinically demonstrated to adversely affect those subjected to the noise. For this reason, the guidelines has provided sections related to noise in the guidelines, not only for construction, but for building performance after occupancies. There are hundreds of renovation efforts compared to brand new greenfield projects. For this reason, phase coordination is required as part of ongoing dialogue with the owner. The owner needs to coordinate utility shutdowns, relocation of people for crane lifts and many other issues to assure the safety of the building occupants. The guidelines provide areas to be considered at a minimum to support the safety of the occupied environment. 
During construction, the design team has the responsibility to make sure the contractor understands the guideline requirements that needs to be adhered to. Workshops to review clearances, infection control measures during phasing, and identifying risks during construction are just a few to you can highlight to the CM team. Design team, owner, and contractor will need to finalize any equipment installation and confirm clearances for adhere to the MEP guidelines required are achieved, requirements are achieved. As construction progresses, the team will need to develop a package to prepare for the Department of Health to walk through. This typically includes the functional program highlighting the guideline chapters referenced, a floor plan with any changes required during construction, meeting minutes from the AHJ meeting during design development, medical gas certifications, ventilation balancing reports highlighting requirements along with engineering approvals, staffing matrix highlighting the operational model and equipment specifications. Many AHJs conduct ongoing inspections during construction. Similar to the design review process itself, the FGI is a good checklist to ensure that you're maintaining compliance. Every construction project has unexpected changes. You're gonna uncover existing conditions that are surprises. Budgets may change, staff needs may change. It's important to remember that when changes are made, you must consider the impact that they have on the provisions of the FGI. Also, don't forget to watch changes in function. They may not appear on the surface to be physical changes to the space, but you should always check the requirements of the FGI. Obviously, changing from a conference room to an operating room is going to come along with some significant requirements and restrictions. Sometimes, though, the changes can be much more subtle. It's a good practice to maintain your functional program as the project progresses, just like you maintain your plans and your specifications. If something changes in the functional program, it should be reviewed in the context of the FGI requirements for that space. In recent years, there has been much more uh, focus on ensuring construction quality and execution. Commissioning is now a requirement of the FGI. It varies a bit from book to book, but it's important to follow these steps to ensure that the building will function as intended. Commissioning is um, uh, performed on infrastructure systems like HVAC, hot water systems, power, et cetera. These are pretty complex systems in, of themselves that are challenging to operate. The FGI rec recognizes this by requiring that equipment manuals, tools, and training be provided to the facility during project completion or closeout. I find that this is a step that's often missed. As an owner's representative, part of my position is promoting awareness in my organizations my professions, and with my employee, the minimum expectations for building projects as well as operations. I use the guidelines on a routine basis to develop an understanding of these expectations, which can be fluid depending on the topic. The guidelines provide a wonderful reference for creating awareness of gaps in current state versus desired state in older facilities, clarifies expectations of regulators to my internal customers, and communicate clearly to senior leader of the needs for program changes. The evolution of the guidelines allows organizations to provide a safe environment with always having the ability to exceed minimum standards. Host occupancy evaluations are a great way to understand how the spaces originally designed are being used after the department is open. These POEs can be a simple clinical team survey or interview, or even shadowing for a day, allowing for operational evaluations on flow and use of rooms. Patient family advisory surveys and or interviews give a great insight into the perception of the design. All these approaches allow you to make informed decisions for future projects and make suggestions to code language changes in 2022. The FTI is not and has never been a retroactive standard. This means that you should not take the current version of the FGI and rigorously apply every requirement to an existing building, especially if that building has not changed since it was constructed. 
Most healthcare structures have a long lifespan and they evolve over time. This makes it difficult for AHJs as we try to get a grasp on what is a reasonable expectation to have of the physical environment. It takes a practical measured approach that should consider the code at the time of original construction and the codes at the time of subsequent renovations or additions. Generally speaking though, a condition should be considered compliant if it is compliant with the codes at the time of construction, if the form and function has not been significantly changed. The oversight of a building post-occupancy though is a complex idea. We do know that buildings degrade over time. We know that maintenance of the physical environment is very important, but some things degrade despite the best efforts of a timely, well-funded maintenance crew. We also learn things, uh, new things about disease transmission and our perception of risk changes with every disaster and every headline. The forces that shape the implied social contract that exists between a facility and the community it serves are complex and shifting. All of these factors can result in retroactive standards or the perception that a standard is being applied retroactively. The best we can do is remain in frequent and frank communication. Reoccurring surveys and inspections are a tool to do this. A good survey and inspection relationship can be rewarding and effective. A bad relationship can be frustrating and divert attention away from risks to distractions. The FGI doesn't provide any guidance on this. Lastly, changes in function should be monitored carefully. Functional drift is a change of use from an originally approved function to a non-approved function, and it's pervasive in facilities. Owners often do not have effective controls to prevent this. Be aware that significant changes, especially those that have physical environment implications, should be reviewed with your AHJ. Thank you so much, Wade, Kirsten, and John, for your overview of how to use the 2018 guidelines documents. I do have a couple of follow-up questions for all of you. First one, you mentioned that the guidelines is not intended for operational purposes. Can you expand on that a bit? So as, a, as an owner, the many times uh, other folks in my organization will um, read part of the guidelines and either, as John alluded, attempt to retroactively apply it or interpret it into an operational standard. Uh, it is not the intent of the Facility Guidelines Institute that this document is an operational document. It is intended for the design of new spaces or renovations. Right, Wade, this, uh, this is, is, is really a design uh, guideline. Uh, we're always looking at new ways of understanding the healthcare delivery system and um, you know, it's it, it's really meant for that new construction or, or renovation purposes, not not an operational manual of how you set up a maintenance schedule or um, how, how you operate a particular piece of equipment. Okay, great. Can you explain the process for getting the guidelines adopted in a given state? That's a good question. I think it will probably vary from state to state. Um, first of all, you have to figure out who is going to adopt the guidelines. Is that going to be a legislative body? Uh, is that going to be a direction of uh, your executive branch? Um, most states uh, are, are going to adopt the guidelines through an administrative process. So that's uh, administrative rules that are uh, governed by uh, a local building department or a state building department or probably most commonly the State Department of Health or Human Services. Um, that, I think, uh, requires that facilities um, be aware of the adoption cycle, what which versions are current, and they work with their uh, authority having jurisdiction to make sure they're aware of it and signal their interest to moving that to, to a new standard or uh, staying with an existing state. Okay, thanks, John. Following up on that, where can I find information on uh, which edition a state has adopted? 
I think there's a really good map on the FGI uh, guidelines website that shows you uh, where and what version states have adopted. And again, you can always ask your authority having jurisdiction when you uh, first make contact with them. So John, even though I asked the question, I'm gonna add to that a little bit. Yes, there is a brand new map on FGI's homepage. Um, you can simply hover your mouse right above a given state and it will tell you how that state is using the guidelines, which edition, and also which documents, whether it's outpatient only or just for nursing homes for residential. So be sure to check it out. Uh, next question, do I have to write a functional program for every project? I'll take this from uh, the designer's uh, point of view. Yes, you need to be handed a functional program for every project, um, no matter how um, small it could be one paragraph um, or an extensive executive summary that um, Wade referenced earlier in the presentation, but you definitely need something in order to go on to understand your goals and, and expectations of the project. And from, from the AHJ's perspective, we, we do need to understand how, um, how we're going to review the project. So that it, it can be very brief or it can be uh, a book. Um, but having that understanding of, of what your intent is, what you're doing, helps us apply the guidelines appropriately. From an owner's standpoint, it helps clearly communicate uh, the, what the program is intended to do um, within the organization, all the way from our board to the, to the staff that are going to be occupying the space. So it really is truly a valuable document. Okay, thanks all of you. Uh, next question, how can you how can you say that these are minimum standards, but at the same time say that they're flexible? How does that work? I, I think that's a challenge with any rule or direction uh, that is taken as an absolute. Uh, when we were writing these guidelines, we were thinking about the typical facilities and services that you would expect to see most of the time. There's always going to be specific cases that we didn't imagine when we're writing a book. Healthcare, healthcare moves really fast, and we're always uh, inventing new ways of delivering care or new uh, treatment modalities or new pieces of gear. Um, we, we could have imagined all of them, but we just didn't have the resources to write 12 books, which is probably what it would take to describe minimum standards for all the endless variations of uh, services and facilities. So really, these, these are intended to be a set of minimum standards that apply to the overwhelming majority of cases. If you've got special conditions, we acknowledge that there should be some accommodations made, and there's, and there's uh, provisions for that. Uh, there's, there's ways to, to look at alternative methods, uh, ways to look at waivers, uh, and we leave that up to a case-by-case -case assessment by the AHJ. Um, there, are, there are tools like Beyond Fundamentals. Uh, I think that's going to be a great tool to help us delve into some of these situations that come up. All right, that leads me into my last question. Um, you've mentioned Beyond Fundamentals a couple of times during your presentation. Can you explain exactly what that is? Well, I think over, over the course of the past couple of years, uh, we, we always have good concepts come up during the code development process um, where at, at the end of the day, we may not be able to get to a complete understanding or we may not have the depth of knowledge uh, and research that, that we think we need to make an informed decision about it. So beyond fundamentals is this concept of um, a, design projects or research projects, white papers, um, additional information that will not only help us understand the provisions of the guidelines themselves, but it will also help us think about emerging trends uh, and, and issues that, that we expect to see. Uh, I, I hope it's a good opportunity for folks to introduce new ideas uh, and put them out there in a forum that um, uh, where we can get a broader understanding of uh, the issue, uh, uh, what the requirements might be, what they, uh, what they should be, and kind of use those as a tool to uh, feed back into the code development process. 
Yeah, the, the Beyond Fundamentals is an excellent place to look at new programs or developing methodolo methodology of care models. Uh, there's there's documents published that will uh, allow a user to evaluate best practice options for the types of services that they may be considering providing. That's a, it's a great tool to al allow um, good dialogue within your organizations as to what level of care you, you do plan to provide for your patients. And Heather, thank you for the um, overview. Yeah, uh, go ahead, John. Can you can you can you find a link to those on the FGI website? Um, you want me to pull it up? Is that what you're saying? Oh, um, for the Beyond Fundamentals. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, yes, you can find information about the Beyond Fundamentals on the FGI website. There's also um, there are Beyond Fundamentals uh, products that are on MADCAD. You go to fgi.madcad.com. But there are some uh, available on our website as well. So definitely go take a look. That's all the time we have today. Thank you for joining us. And thanks to our presenters, Wade Rudolph, John Williams, and Kirsten Waltz. Please remember to see the person who registered your site at the close of the session for information on receiving learning units or certificates. You must be registered through MADCAP to take the survey and obtain credit. Now here's a look at the complete webinar series that FGI is offering on the 2018 guidelines for design and construction documents. We hope that you'll be able to join us for each presentation. Keep current with what's happening at FGI, including updates on adoption, errata, and the upcoming 2022 revision cycle by signing up for our quarterly newsletter, the FGI Bulletin, or following us on LinkedIn. Thanks everyone, have a great day.